It is an honor to be here with you this morning. My name is Patrick Coates. Uh, I serve with the Florida Baptist Convention, one of the networks that uh, your church participates with, and we want to thank you for your partnership. And uh, I love your pastor. Your pastor is a great man, a great encourager to pastors. And uh, I envy him now because uh, Greece is on my bucket list, so when I grow up, I want to be like Tim. <laughs> Uh, I'm here this morning with my lovely wife of 29 years. Uh, I stumbled up. That's one of the one things I got right, man, and uh, married over my head, but God bless her. I love her. We have three amazing children, and uh, God has been good to us. Uh, I want to, uh, to ask you to bow your heads right now as we prepare to look at the Word of God this morning. Dear Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this is the day that you have made. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you because your son is the firm foundation that we stand on. We thank you that you love us despite of us. We thank you that you have redeemed us and you've called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Oh God, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will block out all distractions. Pray that you allow us to dismiss the mess, the cloudiness in our minds, but for a moment that we might be able to hear a word from you. We thank you, O oh God. You are our only hope and our only help. We love you in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. We're in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 29, verse 30, uh, leaning into chapter 30, uh, and I want you to turn your Bibles to that. Um, but I, but I, I submit to you this morning that um, Genesis 29, the story of Jacob, is very challenging to understand if we try to see it from our modern worldview uh, or understand it from our societal norms, our customs, um, our understanding of morality. Uh, we must look at this passage for what it meant to the biblical audience, the ancient biblical audience. And I want you to know, just as we get started unpacking this section of Scripture, that the, the meaning of this biblical narrative is where God is bringing about the fulfillment of his covenant promises, the blessing of Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham. Be blessed, that his seed would be blessed, and that he would be a blessing to the nation. That meant that everywhere Abraham went, God was going to bless and use his life to be a blessing to the people of God. And so God chose Israel, a people, to be his people. This promise was made uh, to Abraham. It was fulfilled through Isaac, and now it is being realized through Jacob, who later you'll see that God calls Jacob. He names him after his people, Israel. And so these three are known as the Hebrew patriots. These are the founders of the nation of Israel. And here in this section of scripture this morning, we have Jacob, the last patriot, where God is fulfilling his covenant. And we see this covenant originates way back in Genesis 12, chapter 1 through 2. If you'll look with me for a moment at that scripture, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your land, your relatives, your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all of the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. There's a message right there for Christians. Jesus said in Matthew, uh, in, the, in Matthew 6, 5 and 6, right? He says that you are the salt of the earth, a light, city on a hill. That means this, wherever we go, we bring flavor, we bring light, we bring the body of Christ, the spirit of Christ to any situation. And so that's a word for someone today because I can remember back in 2020 when the world stopped, the church closed for the first time worldwide in March of 2020. We were on a Zoom with a group of pastors in our network, and one pastor said this profound statement that I want to share with you today. He said, Christians do not live off of what ifs. 
They live off promises. Oh, that ought to make somebody shout today. Christians don't live off what ifs. We don't have to guess. Jesus is not winning. He's already won. Amen. And so the story of God through Israel begins with a man in Abraham. And now in this part of the scripture, we see that God is extending his blessing, his grace, his mercy to a people, Israel. And so in Genesis 29, 31, we have the story of Jacob and his family, how Jacob came to be, and the emphasis on Jacob's 12 sons. That's where this story is going. That's what's developing and unfolding in the Bible narrative. These 12 sons that Jacob has are going to become the tri 12 tribes of Israel that we see all through the Bible. They're going to be the leaders of God's covenant people. And what we learn from this story in the life of patriots um, that is that sin, like today, sin is always present. Since the fall, since God reestablished and rebooted the earth through Noah, that didn't eradicate sin. We know uh, that Jesus is the er eradicator of sin. And so in this story of Jacob's life and Jacob's family, there's trickery, bad choices, there's brokenness. In other words, Jacob's family was a mess. And so as we unpack the biblical narrative, we can see, clearly see in this story, glory be to God, that our God works in the middle of a mess. Amen. If I can make an application here, I want you to know this morning, beloved, that your mess does not stop what God is doing to accomplish his purposes. I thank God that he works despite of me. He works around me, outside of me, and also through me. And so allow me to share just a few observations from the text. Again, it is important to understand this story from the cultural lens of the actual biblical audience. The, the people emphasized in this story is Jacob, amen, who is now uh, the highlight of this story, his uncle Laban. We have Rachel, which was the apple of, of, J of Jacob's eye. He saw her and, and he desired her. And then there's Leah. And so in this story, we see first where the trickster gets tricked, right? The trickster, Jacob, we know, uh, tricked his brother Esau uh, from his birthright. And now we see where Laban is now tricking him. Amen. Talk about what goes around, comes around. And so <laughs> Jacob gets tricked, and, and Laban tricks him and gives him his older daughter. Now, it would be wise to understand that in the ancient Near East culture, it, the, the first are important. First are important. The fourth son, the first daughter is important in a family structure. And so a father would not marry the, the younger daughter before the older daughter. We see that in verse 26, when Jacob asks Laban, why have you deceived me? He says, it's not the custom of our country to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn. And so I submit to you that even though Jacob now has a wife, he was tricked into marrying Leah, he still made a covenant. Now, we don't know the details of the story. We don't know how dark it was in the tent when Leah came in and laid down with them. But he made a covenant with her. They had kids together. And so he could have been satisfied, but Jacob was not satisfied. He still wanted Rachel. We see this in verse 17. It says, Leah had tender eyes, but Rachel was shapely and beautiful. And so even though Jacob was deceived, he could have stopped there and been satisfied because God had blessed him with the wife, but he wanted more. And what we see in this story is that sometimes we move and pursue our desire instead of the purposes of God. It is important to know that Mary and Rachel was Jacob's choice, not God's choice. And according to what we know, amen, about the covenant fulfillment, many times we struggle in life because we want what we desire versus the purposes and plans that God has for our life. And when we pursue our desires, here's what we do. We make a mess 
out of our lives. That's what we see in the story right now. And so he agreed. He wanted Rachel so much. He already had a family. He wanted Rachel so much that he even made a deal. He negotiated a deal with Laban to serve in his house for an additional seven years. And so Jacob makes this agreement with Laban. And what we come to learn from this story is that while Jacob is pursuing the apple of his eye, watch this, God is still at work <laughs> establishing the people of Israel. What I'm saying is God in the middle of this mess is still working things out. He's still orchestrating the sovereignty of God is still pushing his purposes forward. Now, I'm not suggesting that God blesses our mess. But here's what I'm saying this morning, that God works in the middle of a mess. And that's what grace is, right? Is God working for his glory in our lives, even when we're broken, even when we're messing it up, even when we're helpless and hopeless, hopeless God is still working to care about his purposes in our lives. This brings clarity to the New Testament promise what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, and watch this, a called according to his purpose. What that simply means, beloved, this morning is nothing can stop the plans and purposes of God. You can't mess it up. You can't be bad enough. You cannot stop what God is doing. Everything that God decrees or pursues will come about. So I want to highlight a few points in this message that apply to us, that show us how God is always at work bringing about his plans and purposes, not only in our lives, but in the world. And so Jacob, the story of Jacob is like our story. You may see your story in this story, but there are three important realities that happens when we move according to our plans our desires, instead of the plans and purposes of God, we make a mess out of our lives. And so the first thing we see in Jacob's story, the attention focuses in verse 31 on Leah, his wife. And we see first struggle. Here's what I want you to know, that sin produces struggle. When we're off the path and go and pursue our desire, it produces struggle for us. Look at the struggle that Leah communicates in this text that God is showing us. It says in verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was neglected, he opened her womb, but Rachel was able to conceive. Leah conceived, gave birth to a son, and, he na and named him Reuben. For she said, the Lord has seen my affliction, and surely my husband will love me now. She was struggling to, to just win over the love of her husband. She knows that his eyes were pointed towards Rachel, but I'm your wife. I'm the first one. I'm the, I'm the one of purpose, right? And then she conceived again and gave birth to a son. And she said in verse 33, the Lord has heard I'm neglected and give me uh, this son also. And she named him Simeon. And, and, and in verse 34, she conceived again and gave birth to another son and said, at last, my husband will become attracted to me. She's doing everything. There's a struggle. She's pursuing to win the love of her husband. And, and, and because I born three sons for him and she named them Levi. And then in verse 35, she, she, she conceived again and gave birth to a son. And this time she does something different. This time she said, I will praise the Lord. And therefore she named him Judah. And it says that Leah stopped having children. She was struggling. She was struggling, dissatisfied, trying to win the love of her husband. But at least she was pursuing and talking to God and crying out to God with all of her pain. Leah's heart, we see from that section of Scripture, her heart was pointed to the Lord. All she wanted was the love of her husband. And then we see a second reality that we all struggle with. As the story shifts to Rachel in verse 30, right? Rachel is the apple of uh, Jacob's eye, his desired wife, and she becomes jealous because unlike Leah who cried out to God, watch what she does. She points all of her pain towards Jacob. In verse 30, it says, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any child, she envied her sister. Give me sons or I will die, she said to Jacob. 
And so Jacob, who's silent in all of this, all of this mess is going on, and he's silent, right? Jacob becomes angry and said, am I not in the place of God? You know, he has withheld this offspring from you. Folks, I want you to know this morning that sin without repentance is always compounded. It creates a mess out of a mess out of a mess. It goes on generation to generation to generation. But thanks be to God, our God, amen, can turn a mess into a blessing. And so here we see this generational curse picture here. The other truths is we often repeat bad behavior. And so like Sarah did with Abraham, instead of trusting God, Rachel gives her maid in order to have a child. She wants a child so desperately. And she's been set back because she knows she's the love interest and the love of Jacob's life. And she, in verse 3 in chapter 30 says, then she said, here's my maid, Bela, go sleep with her. And she'll bear children so that <laughs> through her, I can too build a family with you. And so she's trying to be validated. And so they're struggled and they're set back. Meanwhile, we see that all of the sons of the tribe of Israel are popping out. And so while they're in the middle of this mess, God is behind the scenes just producing and moving his purposes forward. And so Rachel in verse 4 Said, gave her slave Bela to Jacob as a wife, and he slept with her. And then we see Dan. In verse 7, we see Naphtali. And then now there's this competition going on. And so both of them are trying to orchestrate the purpose of God. I want you to know this morning that you can't, you can't fix your st- destiny. You can't control your life. God's going to bring things about. And so even though they're in the middle of this mess, amen, Leah gets into the competition in verse 9. When she saw that she had stopped having children, she took her slave now and gave her to Jacob. And so Zilpah bore Jacob a son, and there's Gad. In the middle of all of this stuff, God is still working to bring these 12 sons together. Amen. And then in verse 14, Reuben went out during the wheat harvest and found some mandrakes in the field. And when he brought them to his mother Leah, Rachel asked, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Come on and share with me, right? In verse 15, Leah replied to her, isn't it enough that you have taken my husband? Now you also want my son's mandrakes. Well then, Rachel said, he can sleep with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. And in verse 16, when Jacob came in the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him. You must come with me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. And Jacob slept with her that night. But then in verse 17, it says, God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore a fifth son. And then we have Issachar, and then we have Zebulun. And then in verse 22, something happens in Rachel's life. This whole family mess is unfolding. It's it's weird. It's crazy. It says in verse 22, then God remembered Rachel, and he listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son, and she said, God, taken away my disgrace, and she named him Joseph. Isn't that the gospel message there? That's redemption. We mess everything up, but God, who's so rich in mercy and loving, sent Christ Jesus, and he washes us with his blood, and his, you know, the Bible, I love the Bible, says that God will remember our sins, our mess, no more. His forgiveness is as far as the east is from the west. And so as we look at this story of Jacob's family uh, unfold, this thing is messy. It is a mess. And we're talking about drama here. What a mess. We see love. We see the struggle for purpose struggle for love, competition and drama as the fruit of sin. We see choosing our own way as opposed to the way of God. We see dissatisfaction, never satisfied. We see not pursuing purpose. But I submit to you this morning, if you got caught up in the family drama, 
If you got caught up in all of the mess that's happening here, you may miss what God is revealing to his people back then and to us today. This story is all about God establishing nation, the nation of Israel through Jacob in the fulfillment of his covenant promise to Abraham. It's about God simply decreeing that Israel will be his people and they will be blessed and will also be a blessing to the nations of the world. Beloved, that's what I'm trying to tell you this morning, that despite of our mess or the mess that we find ourselves in, God always makes good on his promises. God always pursues and accomplishes his purposes. I want you to see in Proverbs 19 and 21, I love this verse. It simply says this, many are the plans in a person's heart, but the Lord's decree, his laws, his purposes will prevail. This means while you're working on your plans, while you're choosing your way, while you're writing the story of your life, God is also in the background orchestrating his purposes, and it will come about. There are two important verses that bring out the meaning of this text and shows us how God works in the middle of our mess. We talked about struggle, and this story is full of struggle. And if the truth be told, if we're real this morning, there are many of us here today that our lives are full of struggle. We talked about setbacks. This story is full of setbacks. And if the truth be told this morning, in our lives, it's full of setbacks. And we know this is to be expected because Jesus promised in John 16, 33, he says, I've told you these things so that in me, you will have peace. In this life, there will be mess. There will be struggle. There will be trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There's a third principle I want to give you that we see that's real from, that we can learn from this story. And it's the principle of surrender. It is not until we surrender to God that we discover what God is doing in our lives. I submit to you that when we surrender to God, he steps into our mess <laughs> and begins to work out something beautiful. If there's someone here that you're sitting in a mess and you're looking for peace this morning, give your mess to God and let God work it out. And he'll give you a peace that Paul says that surpasses all human understanding. If there's someone here and you got yourself into something that you didn't, you didn't even invite, it just fell on you. God is the one that you can give it to and he can bring you out. Look at Rachel. Rachel had a moment. These two ladies in this story had a moment, I believe, of surrender. In verse 22, after talking to Jacob and saying, you give me a child, fulfill me, <laughs> make it happen, she finally came to a place where she got tired. And listen, you can run as long as you want to, but God will bring you to a place where you'll get tired of orchestrating your life and just depend on him. It says, then God remember Rachel, and he listened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived the son, amen, and and, and she said this, God has taken away my disgrace. And she named her son Joseph. Oh, this is so beautiful because God gave Rachel Joseph. Joseph was her legacy. And Joseph would later become a type of Christ who would be there at a time where Egypt, uh, uh, in Egypt, amen, uh, Israel would be uh, facing famine and God used and raised up Joseph for his glory to lead his people and save his people. He was a type of Christ. But look at Leah, the other wife. Leah had a moment of surrender where she did not only decide to surrender her mess to God, but this time instead of pursuing her husband's love, trying to get him to be attracted to her, in, in chapter 29, verse 35, she decided in the middle of her mess, that I'm just going to worship God. Beloved, there's somebody here this morning that you need to stop trying to press, stop trying to figure it out, and decide I'm going to worship right here in the middle of my mess. Look at the text in 29:35. It says, she conceived again, gave birth to son. She said, this time, 
This time. Somebody needs to just say this time, amen? I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah, and Leah stopped having children. This was the moment of fulfillment. God gave her Judah, and Judah would be the one who is the bloodline of Christ. This morning, the question is, what do you do when you find yourself in the middle of a mess? What do you do when you find yourself in the middle of struggles and setbacks? Well, the answer is simple. You surrender in faith to God. And your surrender invites God to step into your mess and perform his work in your life. And here's the truth, family. It's like Jacob's family, who was a messy family. We don't get to choose our family. And sometimes we don't get to choose our circumstances. But what I know is if we serve God, this is what I know about our God. He's a God that specializes, specializes in messes. He's a God that makes crooked things straight. He's a God that takes broken things and put them back together. He's a God that takes broken pieces and restores them. This story in this Old Testament is a story of redemption, how God brings dead things back to life. I want to testify this morning. I didn't grow up in a conventional family. One of the hardest days for me to preach is on Mother's Day. I was raised by my grandparents. My family was a mess. There are brothers and sisters that I've just met in the last three years. I'm 52 years old. Different parents. My dad died when I was 11 years old. I got to meet him one time. I didn't get to choose my family. And my life could have been broken. My life could have been, my destiny could have been messed up. But that wasn't God's plan. And so God led me to my grandfather who was a pastor who loved on me. I want you to know this morning that even though you find yourself in a mess, even though your family was in a mess, we have a God that specializes in messes. He turns a mess around and he creates something beautiful. I'm a dad now, and I assure you I've made many mistakes. You can ask my wife after service. They don't give you a manual on it, and I've learned that every child's different. When you figure one out, that stuff doesn't work on the next one. Every child is different. But here's what I know, that God takes the little that we have even in our mistakes, he looks beyond that and he continues to carry forward his purpose. And so I'm speaking to somebody today. We talked about generational curses. You might be a kid or even adult and you're still broken and hurt by the mess that your family was in. I want you to know that the story of Jacob teaches us that God takes those broken pieces and he restores them and he makes something beautiful. He makes all things new. And God just wants you to say yes to him. There's an altar this morning. You can come down. If that thing is still beating you up, you can say, God, I'm, I'm a mess. I'm the mess. But I know you can take me and you can take it and turn it around because you sent your son to love somebody like me. And if I repent and believe, my mess can turn into something beautiful. Would you come to the altar and say, God, I'm bringing my mess. Hey, listen, if you're a parent and you've made some mistakes, it's okay. You'll do that again. <laughs> It'll happen again. But look, God, God looks beyond. He reaches beyond your mistakes. And he, he, like all of my siblings, he puts his loving care and hand on them. And he carries forward his purpose and his plan. Everything that God does, he will bring his purpose and plan about with me. I don't know who's here today, but we got an altar. And listen, sometimes you just got to come to the altar before God and say, God, I'm bringing all that I have to you. That's all I can do. I tried to fix it. I tried to walk in it. <laughs> Jacob was silent. <laughs> Maybe he understood that, that God has the answer. I'm going to just let God allow this thing unfold. I want you to know that God can give you peace. 
He can restore. Would you come to the altar? Would you come this morning? There might be somebody here today. We'll pray with you. Somebody here today, you're a parent, you messed up, and you're still, you're still beat up about that thing. Listen, come and be clean. When God forgives, it's settled, it's done. He takes it and he throws it in the sea for, uh, of unforgiveness. As far as the east is from the west, you don't have to carry this morning. Be free this morning. Come to the altar and give thanks. God, I thank you because you did a work in me. I once was lost, I once was blind. But God, you took the mess that was me and you made something beautiful. Would you come, let us worship. Dear Father God, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. I thank you because your purpose has come about. Your plans are sure. You are reliable and we can stand on your promises. I thank you for the great story of redemption that we see even while the mess was happening, you were, your purposes were orchestrating and coming together, your sovereignty and your love and your faithfulness still being carried forward. God, I pray if there's someone here today that's still struggling, dealing with setbacks, that you release them this morning and knowing that you're a God that will take a mess and turn it into something beautiful. In Jesus' name I pray.